That was good, wasn't it? Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, entire worship team this morning. From the stage to the board to the upstairs. Woo! It was broadened, as people would say. Thank you, Jesus. It's so good to be in God's house, to be here this morning, to stand before you. I, I just count it a privilege to, to uh, speak God's word. And um, I pray that, uh, that God will speak through me and, and that uh, you'll hear a message from him. It's good to see all of you guys here. Some really sweet, sweet friends of mine, family that are here. Whew, man. I shed uh, whew, tears of joy a few minutes ago when I saw the Estebane family come in. I love you. Whew. God is good, amen. I got a bunch of precious saints out there watching. Um, for those of you at First Bible Family online, oh, we, we love you. And uh, we look forward to being with you one day. Man, sometimes you feel like uh, the, the teacher has the principal come and sit in the class to see how the teacher does. <laughs> Front row even, man. Front row. No, I just, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just so thankful uh, for the opportunity. And um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and just get... Uh, Let's get rolling. Let's have a wonderful time worshiping in the word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we can come into your presence always. As Stacy sang, you're constant. The same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. And we always have access to your throne by the blood of Jesus. Thank you. So I come into your presence and I just ask that you would speak through me, but even continue to speak to me while I speak. Jesus, be magnified and glorified by all that's done. Keep me out of the way and just say whatever you want to say. Jesus, I love you and I pray this in your precious name. Amen. So today's topic, identity. Identity. Who are you? Who are you? What is your identity? Take a look at your fingertips. You got fingerprints. Tiny ridges, whorls, little valley patterns on the tip of each finger. No two people have been found to have the same fingerprints. You were created by God in his image. And you are totally unique, totally unique. There is only one you. There's only one you. I mean, because of the uniqueness of fingerprints, they're used at crime scenes even. To identify through forensic evidence, culprits of crimes were that unique. But what is your identity? What is your identity? For me... Look at that. A picture from last weekend at our daughter Libby's wedding. The first time I officiated a wedding with someone so tall. I think I still have uh, neck problems from looking up at uh, Wale. Um, my identity. What do people know me as besides the old round bald worship guy? For me, it's husband and dad and poppy and brother and friend and pastor and a son. Last week I joined the 50 club, so that's another identifier. Yesterday I celebrated my, or sorry, we celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary, another identifier. This weekend 10 years ago, was the weekend that we joined First Bible. Ten years ago this weekend. That's some of the things that identify me. But who are you? What is your identity? What defines you? And even more importantly, 
What's your identity in Christ? How does Christ identify you? So take a look at this video to kick things off. There are many things that we used to be, but who are we in Christ? Uh, I just love that video. I am who the I am says I am. That's how I'm defined. You're so valuable to Jesus. You're so valuable to him. So often we define ourselves by our position or our past or our successes or our failures. But who are we in Christ? Who are we in Christ? This week I had a social media experiment that I did. And on Facebook, I put a question, who are you in Christ? And I had a whole lot of responses. I asked people just to give me one word. Had a whole lot of responses and a lot of you guys responded to that. Well, I made a word cloud. Um, Just a word cloud. Take a look at this. Look at all these things that you guys came up with. Pretty amazing. That's who we are in Christ. All these different things. You know, you might have come here today struggling. In an audience this big, some of you are struggling. Maybe you're struggling with your sin or your past, your self-worth, maybe some failures that you've had. Maybe you're just tired. Maybe you're ready to give up. Well, let me just start with a bang to remind you of who you are. Who you are. This is compliments of God's word and my friends on Facebook. This is who God says you are. When someone reminds you of your sin, remember that you are forgiven. God sees you as holy and righteous and spotless and blameless because of his son. Your sins have been cast into a sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. That's our God. When you feel lost, remember that Jesus found you and gave you his word to light your path. When you feel alone, remember that you are loved by God. In fact, he calls you beloved, a daughter, a son. When the guilt of your past creeps in, remember that you are redeemed, set free from sin. You don't have to live in yesterday. When someone points out your flaws and your failures, remember that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are precious. And you are enough to him. Amen. When you are overcome with fear, remember that God has made you more than a conqueror. You can be fearless and courageous because God has given you the spirit of love and of power and of sound mind. When you are reminded of the person you once were, remember that you have been washed and sanctified and justified by Jesus. You are clean. That's who you are. 
When you're overcome with anxiety and fear, remember that you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. Your eternity is secure. When your family fails you, remember that you're a child of God, adopted into his family. When you feel worthless, that you just can't go on, remember that you're so precious and valuable to God that he sacrificed his only begotten son for you. Remember that when you feel worthless because to God you are so valuable. You've been reconciled to him. And the list goes on and on and on. If you know Jesus, that, my brothers and sisters, is who you are. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, today would be a good day to do that and take that next step. Follow him. All right, with that lengthy introduction out of the way, let's jump into our passage today. Go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, talking about our identity, 1 Peter chapter 2. Who am I? And what is my purpose? And I pray that when you leave here today, you'll be able to answer that question. Who am I? And what is my purpose? We have, we have here this wonderful letter. The apostle Peter wrote, and if ever there was someone that struggled with his identity, it was Peter. He had some really high highs and some really low lows. He was something else. Kind of like a lot of us, right? He was a rough and abrasive fisherman that was called to follow Jesus. And then he became one of those closest to Jesus. He learned and ministered with Jesus for his entire ministry of three and a half years. He saw the miracles, but he was also known for putting his foot in his mouth, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time without thinking. Kind of like some of us, right? But he was also the first one to call Jesus the Son of God. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration. He walked on water. But he was also rebuked by Jesus for getting out of line. In fact, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he also cut off the ear of a Roman soldier. He denied Jesus three times, but he was also challenged by Jesus after the resurrection to love his sheep, to love the lambs, to love God's people three times. He became an early church leader, preached at the day of Pentecost. Thousands were saved. The book of Mark is Peter's account of the life of Jesus as told by Peter to John Mark. And then before he was martyred by crucifixion upside down, he wrote these two letters we have we call First and Second Peter. Beautiful, beautiful letters. First Peter was written around 65 AD, just a year after the emperor, Roman Emperor Nero started persecuting the church. And it's no coincidence that the word suffering or some form of it is found 16 times in this first letter. Of Peter. It's to encourage believers to stand in the midst of suffering. Some of us are suffering. And so today, we should be encouraged by the word of God. In the middle of this letter, we've got this wonderful passage. So I'm going to read verses 7 through 10, and we'll highlight verse 9. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained 
mercy. So our highlight today is verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who am I? What is my identity? We've got four things here. Four direct things that God calls us. Titles, responsibilities. And we'll go through each one of these. And then I'll challenge you at the end. Who am I? God tells me in this passage I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar type of people. So let's jump in. You're a chosen generation, a chosen generation. I've been chosen by God. I've been appointed. I've been picked out. I've been called. Of this generation, this current generation, this kindred of believers that we have, this family, this tribe, this offspring, we've been selected for a specific purpose. Selected. We're his appointed family. We're the ones called to carry out his work right here, right now. A chosen generation. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. He's chosen to bless us. Second Chronicles 7 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What privileges we have as part of God's chosen generation. In Romans chapter 9, it says, I will call them, he's speaking of the Gentiles, I will call them my people, which were not my people. And I'll call her beloved, which was not beloved. That's who God calls his church. His people and his beloved. His people and his beloved. Turn with me to Esther. Let's take a look at this one real quick. We'll turn a few times in the word of God. No better book that we can turn in. Amen. Amen, church. Are you with me? All right. Esther chapter 4. So Esther here, if you don't know about the, the book of Esther, Esther was a young Jewish girl chosen to be the queen. And there was a plot to destroy all the nation of Israel. And we're just going to make a long story short. Esther was put as the queen into a position of influence. But she was afraid. She had some doubts whether or not she could stand boldly and talk about her people in front of the king and her father figure her cousin Mordecai challenged her that she had been chosen for that very moment in time so we're just going to read a couple of verses Esther chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 it says then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? For such a time as this. Many messages preached on that phrase. Mordecai was telling Esther she had been appointed by God for that specific time and for the specific purpose of saving the nation of Israel. And because she laid down her fears and trusted in God, the nation of Israel was saved. And my brothers and sisters, as God's chosen generation, the ones here today, the body of Christ We, like Esther, have been appointed for such a time as this. For such a time as this. In the world of COVID, we have been appointed for such a time as this. We're a chosen generation of people because there are people around us that need a Savior. Right here, right now. We're the ones God has called to take his light and his love to those in need of a savior. We're alive right now as the hands and feet of Jesus, the body of Christ, his church. 
a chosen generation. What are you going to do with that? He selected you to be his light right now. That comes with responsibility, doesn't it? You're a chosen generation. Let's go to the second one back in 1 Peter. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. God calls you a royal priesthood, the second identifier, the second title, royal priesthood. And you're like, I'm a royal priest? You are a royal priest. Kingly and regal and royal. And you're a believer that needs to fulfill the priestly duties that God has called you to fulfill. You're like, whoa, hey, uh, that's like for Bobby and Brownie. You know, what, what? I didn't say it. God said it. Chosen generation, royal priesthood. We're God's royal representatives. Royalty is what God calls you. Royalty. Don't you have direct access to God? Aren't you a joint heir with Jesus? You are royalty, Scripture tells us. Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Aren't you glad that we as the church were grafted into the family of God? And we can cling to the same promises that God has for his family. Priests and kings were peculiar treasures to the Lord. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. You're there. Just look at verse 5 in that same chapter. This is what... This is what Peter says, in case you were, were saying, hey, that was Old Testament stuff. Chapter 2, verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Holy priesthood called to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And then in Revelation, three different times it talks about it, and I'll just read one of them. It says in chapter 1, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Kings. And priest, you are royal representatives of God. Jesus washed our sins away with his blood and then made us kings and priests. We're part of God's royal priesthood, the family of God. But along with that comes the responsibility of priestly duties. We're to represent Jesus to everyone that's around us. We are his representative we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We're to know the word and teach the word and live by the word. Those are priestly duties God has called us all to have. Are you with me so far? So now, before I jump to the third one, a few weeks ago, Heather, uh, Teresa took Heather and Bethany Carter to the airport at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, I got up and said goodbye to them, and well, then I, now I'm awake, and I'm like, I gotta, go, I gotta get a little bit more sleep. This is this is terrible. So I st I played some music. I already listened to this music. Got my iTunes going. Listen to some music. Well, evidently on my iTunes there's like a sermon of myself from like 15 years ago, and I'm laying in bed and I'm listening to myself preach. Well, it worked. I put myself to sleep. <laughs> but I'm praying that doesn't happen today for you. Don't, don't be lulled into sleep, all right? That's just for me. So that's my cure for insomnia. Listen to myself preach. The third one. <laughs> Your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. And holy nation. Now, is this talking about the United States of America? No, it's not talking about the United States of America. It's talking about 
the nation of believers, this people of believers, our kindred, our family, the family of God, the holy nation that we should be a part of. Go to Romans chapter 12. You guys, a lot of you can quote this verse, Romans chapter 12. Beautiful, beautiful passage here. Romans chapter 12, just verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, you're, you're called to be a part of a holy nation, most revered, saintly, called for a purpose by God as part of this multitude of believers, this nation of believers, Peter calls it. God has called us a most revered people. We are his holy saints. We're set apart for a purpose. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus wants his church to be holy, without spot, without blemish. 2 Timothy 1 tells us that we have a holy calling from God. And then Peter, just a few paragraphs before our passage today, says... But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He's called us to be holy, part of a holy nation. Our responsibility is to live holy lifestyles. When we fall short, we need to get on our knees and cry out to God with repentant hearts. God, I want to be holy. Cleanse me of my iniquities. Forgive me for my sin. Make me more like you, Jesus. That should be our response. Godly sorrow leadeth to repentance and subsequent holiness. He's called us to be holy. We are God's holy nation of saints. God's holy nation of of saints. We've got a fourth one. You're a chosen generation, a royal priest, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, this fourth responsibility, this fourth title, this fourth role we're supposed to play is peculiar people. Usually when the word peculiar is used in our English today, it's a negative connotation, something that's really, really off. Kind of strange, kind of weird, kind of different. In this passage here, it talks of how precious we are to God. That we're his prized possession. That he bought us with his blood. We're purchased and preserved in God's possession. We're a special treasure to God. That's what God thinks of you. You're a special treasure to God not strange, not weird, but you are supposed to be different. You are supposed to be different. I mean, think about the fact that he calls us the bride of Christ. There's something special about that. The bride of Christ. That's our title. And we're reserved by him for a special Purposed. We are his people in a very real way. Peculiar. Peculiar. Acts 20 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus purchased us with his own blood. Oh, what value you have to him. Oh, what value you have to him. Never think, never think that you are not valuable and that you are not, oh, so special to God. Because God said, I'm going to give my only begotten son to make a way for you. You are valuable to him, so precious to him, so precious to him, a peculiar people. Deuteronomy 7 says, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth because we were grafted in, we're part of God's family, he calls us special. You are 
special to God. You are special to God. And go with me to Titus. Flip a few pages to the book of Titus. Look at a passage here, chapter 2. Beautiful, beautiful scripture here. Paul writing to the pastor at Crete, Titus. He says in verse 14, talking of Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. A peculiar people zealous of good works. Because Jesus gave his life for ours, our response should be to live for him. To live pure lives for him, to live holy lives for him. You see, we need to stand out from the world so that the world sees what they need with Jesus speaking through us. We need to live differently than the world. We should be, as the the banners say from our conference, uncommon, peculiar, different. Our speech should be different. Our actions should be different. Our attitudes should be different. The way that we respond to situations should be different. Our courage should stand out. The hope that we have in Jesus should stand out. The faith that we have in our Lord and his word should stand out. The fruit of God's spirit should shine through us. We should be different. Are you different? Do you stand out among your coworkers? Do you stand out among your families? Do your children see how much you love the Lord? Husbands, do you love your wives the way that Christ loved the church? Wives, do you submit to your husbands the way that you would to Jesus. That's what Ephesians 5 tells us to do. That's living differently than the world. Do you love unconditionally? That's living different than the world. We're called to be peculiar people. Peculiar people as the bride of Christ. All right. So, who am I? What is my purpose? I mean, it's so awesome to see all the things that people on Facebook put from God's word. It's awesome to see these four things that God has told us that we are. Well, what do we do with all that? What do we do with all that? As we fulfill all the roles that we have in our lives, we've got to forget, we've got to remember and never forget what our purpose really is. And it takes us to the last part of the verse. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, that phrase, show forth, means to declare it to publish it, to proclaim it, to celebrate it, to let it out. Showing forth his praises has the connotation of excitement, almost as exciting as an October snow. Yes. (laughs) Did I say that out loud? Sorry. We should be able to get excited about Jesus and about what he has done for us. Are you with me, church? We ought to be able to get excited. If you're a Christian, this is part of your purpose. To show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isaiah 43 says, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praises. Matthew 5 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And Philippians 2 talks about how we shine as lights in a dark, crooked world. 
The world needs to see Jesus in you, in me. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? The world needs to see Jesus in us. God has commissioned us to praise him, to show forth his praises, to let everyone know about the goodness of our great God. And we've got to be proclaiming the good news of Jesus and showing forth his praises everywhere we go. To everyone we come in contact with, there are people that are struggling and are living in darkness and they're just desperate for hope. We have hope. They need to see that in us. At home, at school, at work, at church, in the community, when you're out for dinner, when you're shopping, and the sale price didn't just ring up the way it was supposed to, when you're playing sports, when you're traveling, people should see something different about you. You should be showing forth the praises of God. When a server comes to your table, say, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to pray for my dinner. Is there anything that I can pray for for you? That blows people away. Sometimes people will just start crying and say, I'm so thankful that you care and, and, and I have this going on in my life. Thank you for praying for me. There's so many little things that we can do to shine out the light of Jesus that gives us opportunities to share the gospel of Christ. But we've got to be diligent about showing forth his praises. We've all got different vocations and different roles that we play but realize he's called you for a purpose. It's not just the leaders of the church, not just the most mature believers. It's all believers. We've got to show everyone how great he is, how he changed our lives. I'm so thankful he changed my life. I'm so thankful. So let me, as I wrap this up, oh, I forgot to put that on there. As I wrap this up, let me go back to my word cloud. You are not who you once were. If you're a believer, if you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus, you are not who you once were. You're a child of God. Child of God. I'm so glad that I met Jesus and that he changed my life. I'm not who I once was. Your mistakes do not define you anymore. Who you were yesterday does not define you. You're not defined by the labels that other people put on you. You're not defined even by your talents and your bank account and your education, at least not spiritually. In Christ, you are redeemed and blameless, and valuable, and wanted, and worthy, and made new, and alive, and justified, and sanctified, and you're holy now, and you're precious, and you're loved by Almighty God, and a whole lot more. That's who you are. That's what he's made you. This is how God defines you. You're chosen and called out by God for a specific purpose. You've got direct access to God anytime as a royal priest. You're in a holy nation of believers that stand with you. You're special. You're valuable, peculiar, purchased by the very blood of Jesus and called to follow him and be holy and serve him. That's how we are defined. Amen. The word Christian, I love the word Christian. It's so misused during this time of election, politics. Every, everyone's a man or woman of faith. People say a lot of things to get votes, right? Don't worry, I'm not going to get on to the election stuff. I'm, I'm more excited about October snow. <laughs> the word Christian literally just means little Christ. 
a miniature version. We're to follow in his footsteps. Follow in his footsteps. Hopefully we get enough snow where a little child can follow in the footsteps of their mom or dad this week, right? No. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's what a Christian really is. One that brings honor to his name, that strives to be like him. If you've struggled with your identity, today's the day to give that struggle to Jesus. In him, you are so much more than how you've even defined yourself. If you're stuck in a rut, maybe of self-condemnation, today's the day to lay that down. Because of the blood of Jesus, you are seen by God as sinless and spotless, and you don't have to feel guilty anymore if your sins are under the blood. Do you feel guilty about your past? Remember, Jesus didn't condemn the very woman found in the act of adultery. He said, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He tells you that. He doesn't condemn you, but he says, hey, you need to leave that lifestyle behind. And you need to go and sin no more. He, don't, he doesn't condemn. And if you've never met Jesus, I beg of you. I beg of you to give your life to him. You will never be the same. You will never be the same. There in our time of invitation, come talk to somebody. Or find somebody after church or give somebody a phone call this afternoon. You'll never be the same. It changed my life and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you. Oh, I thank you. Good, good Father. Everlasting Father. Lord Almighty that you would use us, these earthen vessels, it's wondrous to me, that you would shine forth your glory through us, this flesh, it's uh, incredible. And yet you've chosen to do that. And you've called us royal priests and peculiar people and holy nation and a chosen generation. Sometimes my heart just overflows at how you see me, and it really should overflow more. And so I thank you that we've had this time in your presence. I thank you that we've worshiped around your word. And I just ask that now that as we begin our time of invitation, that, that you would just work in our midst and do what only you can do, Jesus. And I pray this in your name. Go ahead and start that song, Debbie.